Welcome to the Customer Innovation Series, where you're about to see six unique stories of transformation. Your peers from around the globe will talk about their challenges, share how they solved them, and offer lessons learned. Let's kick off the series with a Google Cloud Partner customer story from Atos Maven Wave, featuring Jason Sharples, Chief Technology Officer of Global Payments. Jason shares how they improved employee collaboration with Google Workspace and began their journey of migrating core applications from on-premise data centers to the cloud. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's probably dear to many of you, how to get your increasingly distributed teams to work better together, how to create order from the disparate systems that come with mergers, acquisitions, and changing procurement policies over generations of tech. How to start working faster, more flexibly, and more securely. These are all things we've accomplished at Global Payments over the past few years, working with Google Cloud and their consulting partner, Atos Maven Wave. Even if you haven't heard of Global Payments, you've encountered us. Among other things, we are one of the world's largest payments technology companies, serving 4 million merchants and thousands of financial institutions. Our merchant solutions segment provides customized software and services to help merchants run their businesses from front of house to the back of the house. Our issue solution segment provides technology products and processing services to large financial institutions, fintechs, neobanks, startups, and retailers who issue credit cards. It also offers B2B payment solutions. Today, we are far ahead of our competitors from a technology perspective. As just one example, we are already a top quartile SaaS company with even more ambitious goals. As you can imagine, we've acquired a lot of companies over the years as we've grown, each with their own technology stacks, communications and productivity systems. We've seen and adopted several generations of communications and collaboration tech ourselves. So in 2016, we decided we would develop a single, reliable, cutting-edge productivity platform that could empower and strengthen every employee and team, speeding our customer responsiveness and boosting innovation. We chose Google Workspace and Atos Maven Wave to make this a reality. We chose Google for their products like Anywhere, Anytime Chromebooks, real-time collaboration on Docs and Sheets, brainstorming across continents in real time on Jamboards and tools like Chat and Meet that enable us to work together to deliver for customers in real time. To give you just one example, before Google, a business leader spilled a can of soda on their laptop, losing three years of data and requiring a month to get back up to speed. With a Chromebook, they would have just shrugged, picked up another machine and been back at work in a minute. That's incalculable savings. And it wasn't just the excellent Google products. What convinced us was their responsiveness. They walked the walk, improving their products and responding to our request for new features and changes very quickly. That all sounds great, I know. But here's the thing. When you are using technology to change your corporate DNA, and if you're serious that this is what you are after, you need to think long and hard about the human factor. So when we thought about minimizing the stress we know people go through when they have to learn new ways of working, we in Atos Maven Wave focused on the human element. Leadership at our company is technically adept, so it wasn't hard to make ourselves the first part of the organization to go to workspace. Besides, everyone everywhere knows how to use Gmail and calendars, and learning Chromebooks just means learning how a browser works. But the corporate commitment signal it sends having these leaders adopt the platform first is invaluable. Elsewhere, we activated our culture of peer comment and collaboration to prepare, teach and evangelize the benefits of workspace and show directly the ease of use of added features. Our Google guides were team members who volunteered to assist and answer questions as the program rolled out across the organization. The group has continued to evolve by itself, adopting best practice where they find them to ensure that the full employee base gets the very best service. Recently, the group created efficiency workshops, such as 
how to be really good at sheets that spread through positive word of mouth recommendations across the company. This demonstrates how we're achieving our objectives through decentralized, democratic, and high proficient ways to improve performance. The proof is always in the doing. The original phase brought 12,000 users onto Workspace in a year. Subsequent smaller acquisitions took a month or so. The last larger task was bringing on 12,000 additional users in a year without generating noise or distracting them from their ability to do business. We've replaced expensive, hard to manage laptops with Chromebooks, tablets, Macs, phones, really anything people want to use. Whereas before, meetings would start with people spending a few minutes starting their computers, looking for documents and complaining, now we just get to work. We demised independent intranets in favor of a single intranet that plugs directly into Google Workspace, leveraging docs, contacts, and analytics. We're opening offices that are Wi-Fi only with no desk phones, since we've got stable and secure communications in video, chat, and of course, good old email. So there's lots of networking and telecom hassle out of the picture as well. When COVID hit, the 24,000 employee base of Global Payments was perfectly placed to pivot to remote working without skipping a beat. This allowed us to continue to execute our projects, answer calls, and deliver to our customers. One of the things I'm most excited about is the way these products are constantly growing and improving. I've mentioned how efficiently they blended our feedback into the products with seamless updates. We are now a comment-driven organization. We have the ability to collaborate effectively to drive progress through an asynchronous and synchronous manner. Meetings focused on resolving comments. We are opinionated, we are engaged, and we are highly efficient. And I've got to call out to our friends at Atos Mavenwave here, who provided high contact training for app sheets. Our teams have started using app sheets to build internal and desktop apps. And this is being done by the people in departments that will use them, such as people from accounting, HR and procurement. Because one thing we know is that everyone is now a digital native, capable of leveraging great tools to solve their business problems. The cultural shift engendered by Atos Mavenwave and Google Workspace changed the way we as a company perceive the capabilities of the cloud. If Google can run everything we rely upon, can we run our workloads in the cloud to support our customers? And if we can run workloads, we can modernize from monolithic mainframes to services. Atos Mavenway has been instrumental in creating a pragmatic modernization plan for one of our most important workloads that supports a million merchants across 15 countries. They are helping convert 5 million COBOL lines of code into Java on GCP, taking advantage of the best advances in cloud development, testing and deployment, all the way through to scalability up and down to remove bottlenecks and move at the speed the business demands. The job of migrating merchant acquiring technology to Google Cloud is not only focused on bridging the application technology gap, but also enabling our existing developers to embrace cloud technologies. Sometimes these developers perceive cloud as an enemy, but they are a critical facet of the cloud journey because of their business and application knowledge. ATOS Mavenwave helped us upskill our team members in cloud practices so they could continue to be a critical part of our innovation efforts. I can't wait to see what the future holds for this partnership, which has already saved us time, money and headaches and helped take global payments into a more dynamic and collaborative future. Thank you very much. What a great story from Jason, right? Showcasing great work between the teams at Global Payments, Atos, Mavenwave, and Google Cloud. We'll now hear from Laura Merling, Chief Transformation and Operations Officer at Arvest Bank. Laura dives into how they are building a new data platform to accelerate their journey from a regional community bank to providing services nationwide. 
This week is my first year anniversary at Arvest. It might be interesting to share with you why I left a Silicon Valley company to join a community bank in Bentonville, Arkansas. Well, the answer is the financial services industry is in the middle of a disruption. And I like the opportunity that disruption brings. It's an important opportunity. And for us, it's an opportunity to rethink what it means to be a community bank in a digital world. I find it exciting and I hope you do too. So who is Arvest Bank? Arvest Bank is a leading community-based financial institution with more than 26 billion in assets. We are also serving more than 110 communities across Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas. It's a high priority for us to continually invest in providing the digital tools and services that our customers expect, both our retail customers and our growing commercial customer base. So where are we on this transformation journey one year in? Well, we know that transformation impacts every aspect of our business. We're reimagining what it means to be a community bank in a digital world. And so in order to do that, we spent the last year identifying our path forward to align our business strategy with our technology strategy. The technology stack is critical in order to allow us to be flexible in meeting our customers' needs. It all starts for us on the path with cloud computing, as well as a new data platform, and we've decided to take on building a new banking core as the foundation. So where are we headed from here? Our journey to defining what it means to be a community bank in a digital world means we're taking a look at each aspect of the bank and we're looking to create a consistent experience across all channels. We need to be hyper-focused on the customer and what they need. That means we actually have to think about data at the center of everything that we do, whether it's front office or back office, and especially when it comes to facing the customer. So let me tell you a little bit about a customer story and data. One of the things that we learned was we had done some research and understood that our customers preferred or told us they preferred more ATMs and longer branch hours. Well, that tells you one story, but then when you look at that same data from a different perspective, those exact same customers actually told us that they preferred a digital channel. Over 95% of them preferred digitally. And so you have to kind of take a step back and say, well, what does that really mean? Uh, and if we hadn't looked at the data from both angles and thought about it, we wouldn't get that answer right. It's at the center of everything we do is data, for, at least from this point forward. So that was the foundation. Now we have other foundational pillars that support our things like our back office and our contact center. We have to provide a level of simplification and automation, removing manual processes and creating operational efficiencies. So around that, we had to think about what does it mean? How do, we, how do we get these efficiencies, create new customer experiences? And so at the center of our transformation is a shift as a business to having a data mindset. We needed to actually redefine our customer interaction models and our back office operations. And so at the heart of it, we decided to build a data platform based on GCP. So this data platform, we also wanted to give it a vision a vision that aligned with our business vision. So the data platform is to be a living architecture that will be built as a foundation to support Arvest's future. It will be using real-time data for experiences and decisions. And it's really important to keep that as part of your mindset and create a vision for where you're taking your data platform to know what you need to create and how you think about that future state. So in defining the data platform, we also said, well, how are we gonna do this? We can't just lift and shift all the data. So we identified six use cases and each one of these use cases had a set of criteria. The first criteria was it had to be solving an immediate pain point for the business and it had to be able to be solved within 90 days. Each one of the criteria or each one of the business cases, I should say, or use cases needed to actually test an end to end you know, aspect of the data platform. So whether it was access to real-time data for AI decisioning, or whether it was to do reporting, or even creating new digital experiences for customers. And of course, we all wanted to be able to ingest third-party data, and so what does that look like? Well, we did all of this, and we've been doing all this while standing up our GCP foundations over the last year. Um, we had a desire to move fast, and we have been moving fast, but of course, there's lots of lessons to learn. We identified data sources, we set up the infrastructure, and we enabled access and permissions. 
Then we ingested the data and we did a bunch of transformations and we did those once it was all in GCP. And then you think we'd be ready to go. So we partnered with the Google PSO team, the Google Professional Services Organization, uh, to jointly pursue an automation of underwriting. So think about this, how do you decide who you give a loan? And so think this as small business customers and what we call our Arvest Opportunity Fund. The Arvest Opportunity Fund is where we extend uh, loans to small business customers that might not normally be eligible. And so being able to automate that process is really key to our business. Now, we've got all those steps done and we're on our path forward, but we did take a lot of lessons learned along that way. The pre three primary lessons that we think we've gotten out of this transformation so far around our data platform are around, um, we'll start with and say, the first one is really around who needs to know what? Who needs to learn the data platform and what do they need to learn? Uh, first and foremost, we didn't have enough people trained uh, on the platform and we needed to make sure that, so it was about who did we anticipate needed to be trained versus who need to be trained? And then did we have learning journeys identified for them? What do they need to learn and over what period of time? And then of course, making the time available for them to learn while they're trying to build the data platform. It's all kind of tricky, but really important to do. Second, um, we learned that we had not established a framework that met the needs of our internal teams nor our partners as they looked to get access to the different data sources. We ultimately needed to create a set of persona templates for the access. Now, it seems like you would have thought of that up front, and we thought we had, but once we started getting people access to the data and started thinking about the use cases, um, we learned what the real needs were and the access requirements. Lastly, we realized that while we had set up some of the foundational aspects of GCP and we had set up the data platform, um, we had not actually set up the environment to begin using the pre-built AI, AI models that come with Google. So think the Vertex platform. Were we really ready to consume it? We weren't. So those were kind of our three major lessons. Um, they're all good learnings, uh, lots of progress since then, and we're off and running. Back to moving fast. Look forward to seeing you on the other side. Thank you so much, Laura. To hear more about Arvis Bank's digital transformation, be sure to catch her panel discussion with Google Cloud and Thought Machine. Look for the session ID INV108 in the next session catalog. Let's peek into another dimension of the financial industry with Ari Stunitzer, Managing Director, Architecture and Product Management at the CME Group, the world's leading derivatives marketplace. This Deloitte customer will share how their Google Cloud Platform Experience team worked with application and platform teams to better manage costs, improve efficiencies, and accelerate migration. Just under a year ago, we announced that CME Group would move our technology portfolio to Google Cloud. We have an aggressive timeline for our transition, and along with Deloitte and Google Cloud, we've been working hard to deliver on our commitments. We're working not just to improve our technology, but change how we work, creating a more outcome-focused process that helps CME Group customers use our products more efficiently, more securely, and in ways that better meet their needs. What I want to talk about today is how we created a new outcome-oriented system of architecting, migrating, and training our teams on Google Cloud. We did it to serve our customers better, and I believe our method has important lessons for many of you watching today. First, let me tell you a little bit about CME Group. As one of the largest financial exchanges in the world, CME Group is the only exchange where every major asset class can be traded on a single platform. Our futures and options products help customers manage risk across commodities, interest rates, currencies, energy, metals, and many other asset classes. And our markets create data and information that is then used by traders, financial institutions, farmers, governments, news organizations, and anyone interested in critical aspects of the global economy. In some cases, our customers use our applications directly, or they might use our data and information from other providers. In fact, one of the many reasons we partnered with Google Cloud is its strong capabilities and data with a goal of increasing developer productivity, increasing software flexibility, and improving operational excellence while maintaining the highest levels of security. 
Many of you know the adage, security, resiliency, and velocity, pick two. Well, this is an effort to be able to get all three. To make it even more interesting, and I don't think I'm alone, we wanted to move from development to production in just a few months with limited resources and internal staff who were gaining GCP experience on the fly with still an on-prem system to support. And of course, all of that using a mixture of GCP native services, legacy systems on-prem, and a number of third-party tools. It's sort of like maintaining a jet engine in flight while transforming the fuel system and training the ground crew all at the same time. So here's what we did. We started with principles. What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? What kind of experience do we want our customers to have? When you're passionate about customers like we are, the opportunity to enhance our technology and improve our customer experience is quite motivating. The experience we want them to have is software they can easily access at scale to make better decisions. So working with Deloitte, we built a cloud experience team designed to bridge our application and platform teams. The goal was not only to improve the productivity of our platform team, allowing them to focus on their delivery, but to increase the velocity of our application migration teams as well. The CloudX team was the first thing we set up, ensuring there was proficiency in both platform and software tools, and a common set of goals to be able to communicate to other teams. They also act as a central point of questions, building a repository for documentation, for self-service training. The CloudX team is made up of CME Group and Deloitte team members with application, operational, and GCP knowledge who support application migrations in an outcome-oriented, sustainable way. Each team member has specific expertise, which underlines the importance of initial team selection. Working with the application teams, the CloudX team embeds and helps in the delivery of software and Google Cloud services. If questions arise, the CloudX team not only answers them, but documents what was done so others can learn and deliver faster. The mantra is experiment, learn, share quickly. With the CloudX team supporting the application teams, our platform team can focus on their delivery. This approach increases confidence in delivery while overcoming many of the ramp up challenges common in a cloud migration. So how do we judge the success of this approach? We wanted better productivity and track that by ticket resolution. Issues have cleared faster than we projected. Applications are growing in depth and capability and people are spending more time on their core delivery rather than context switching. We wanted an effective support and training process to quickly bring team members up to speed on Google Cloud. Centralizing support with the CloudX team allowed us to enhance training while providing a sustainable outcome-oriented delivery model. We wanted fast adoption. I mentioned that we had an aggressive timeline for bringing CME Group to Google Cloud. And I'm pleased to say that we're pretty much on schedule with increasing velocity. Maybe even more important, I think we'll arrive at our goal to deliver more and better customer products and experiences thanks to our adoption framework. Based on our success, here's what I could recommend you remember. One, there's already a lot of knowledge in your organization and there's a hunger to deliver and learn more by your teams. Leverage that by connecting with all of your teams through a central group that is focused on the key outcome of customer experience. Share information and practices to ensure consistency of performance. Two, everyone learns a little bit differently in their roles. So you want to allow healthy experimentation. That means asking questions, trying things, and above all, sharing learnings and outcomes. That is the start of building your team's best practices. Lastly, success in technology always comes from a healthy blend of understanding your customers' problems and knowing how technology can solve them. Outcome-oriented adoption is a consistent blend of those things with a common framework of delivery. Thank you very much for your time. 
and good luck in your efforts. See you in the cloud. What I loved about this story is the teamwork and focus on the customer experience to allow for health experimentation and continuous learning. Let's move on to Brazil and hear Priscilla Mie, the Chief Technology Officer of Ije Sao Ije, inspire us with how they're reimagining ways of maintaining health and delivering healthcare to 11 million people living in the south of Brazil. Hello from Brazil, I'm Priscila Mie and I am the Chief Technology Officer of Ija Saúde, a company delivering new ways of maintaining health and delivering health care to the people living in the south of Brazil, which makes up about 11 million people. Today, I want to talk about how we are doing that affordably with data-driven services on Google Cloud and with a diversity-based approach to company organization that has grown thanks to Google Cloud's efforts. Healthcare for the people of Brazil is an enormous opportunity. Our research shows only 20% of Brazilians have health insurance. Not only that, only 19% of people with health insurance have regular medical exams. Almost two-thirds don't know what a routine checkup is. The reason for this is that Brazilians see medicine as a financial worry, not a health benefit. They fear they won't have money to take care of their illness. They need better health insurance delivered to them in a personalized way they can understand and effort. By bringing together experts in medicine, financy and data science, Ija Saúde developed a solution that provides individuals and companies different types of health services, including preventive screenings, follow-ups, health scoring, and medical records management. We can offer products with discounts, benefits, schedule appointments, and exams. On the financial side, we provide financial and credit solution for both clients and business partners. Working alongside HR departments, we can understand the health of all employees safely and securely. Our affiliated network and has an extensive portfolio of insurance, investment, telemedicine and digital prescription. As you can imagine, building this company to scale across Brazil, large population could be an enormously costly proposition. Our technology must be secure. It must be easy to operate and reliable for the consumer. It must handle enormous data loads. That's why it was to be reliable. It must be able to grow without overloading our operating costs with charges for storage, compute, and networking. We had a vision and we had built much of the technology, but not in a way that could meet all of our needs or take us to where we needed to grow. After some success, we realized we needed to improve our operations and user experience by restructuring our entire architecture. That's when we came to Google Cloud. One thing I didn't mention before, over 50% of our top executives are women. And we have designed Isha Saúde to be a diversity-first organization. So, we can better react Brazilians at every level of society. How half of our company has been hired through our diversity program. Attending a Google Cloud Accelerator for startups 
allowed us to think not just about the architecture in a stronger and more robust way, but we began to look at ways we could decelerate the performance of our algorithms while also working on our internal learning. Google Cloud believes their programs, technical mentorships could help facilitate our learning and growth, and it really helped us better analyze the health of employee populations. With the mentorship, we have created a squad to learn and work together on a technological challenge. The mentors perform close interactions almost hands-on, to help us as much as possible. The first challenge was the cloud migration. We migrate from our previous cloud infrastructure and re-architected our offering to function as a series of microservices. This decreased our cost and built up scalability. Next. We also added key products like Google Vision to read medical prescription and reports, apply ML predictions, and help people change their routines. Cloud Run manage instances for location hosting. Dataprox securely prep process our data while cloud storage and BigQuery run our ML algorithms faster and more reliable than before. Here are some results from operating on Google Cloud Platform after just 16 months. Our data requests have 40% less latency when compared to our experience on another major cloud provider. RAM optimization on Cloud SQL has cut storage costs by a third. Our optical character recognition accuracy is 15% better on Google Vision, ensuring better results for our physicians and associated customers. Using Dataproc, our clustering time went from 5 minutes to 90 seconds. Faster, cheaper and better. Nice, right? But the real benefit is in the business. Like I said, these are early days. We are excited by the results and we are confident that Ija Saúde can play a positive role in giving people more control over better health. Today, 70% of deaths around the world are due to preventable chronic non-communicable disease. With better education, and better means of control. We want people to accumulate the financial resources to take care of their health better, especially in a preventive way. Our two biggest priorities for the future are to be a reference in a digital transformation in the health chain and to generate a greater positive impact for efforts like ours in the business community. I'd like to thank you, Google, for their assistance and helping us building our dream better. And encourage you to contact me if you want to discuss more about our company, your company, or ways to build better in the cloud. Thank you. We're so excited to see how EJ So EJ continues to make progress in supporting people with the financial resources to address preventable diseases. Now let's travel to Australia and meet Duncan Permazel, the general manager of retail sales and marketing at Origin Energy. Working with Accenture and Google Cloud, the energy company is helping homeowners better manage their own power solutions with a new consumer solar application. Origin is an integrated energy company in Australia with 4.5 million customer accounts across electricity, natural gas, LPG and broadband. We retail through our three key segments, consumer, where I'll focus today, but also small to medium enterprises and the commercial and industrial segments. In our consumer customer base, we also provide other services such as solar and storage. 
where we will design and install solar and storage solutions for our customers. At Origin, our purpose is getting energy right for our customers, community and planet. And our ambition and strategy is to lead the transition to net zero through cleaner energy and customer solutions. One way we'll do this and a key pillar of our strategy is by offering unrivaled customer solutions. And part of this is making it simple and easy for customers to access clean and smart energy solutions. Origin partnered with Accenture and Google Cloud to launch the new solar growth platform app. The tool uses 3D data, visual AI, and advanced analytics to show customers how solar panels can help save energy. It can measure things like roof pitch, area, and energy consumption to calculate the most suitable solar product for any household. This innovation is a great example of how we can equip homes with solutions to make a difference. Origin's been a leading retailer and installer of rooftop solar in Australia for over 15 years. In that time, we've helped more than 110,000 Australians go solar, and that is more than any other installer over that time period. However, the industry itself is a very disaggregated and highly competitive industry with relatively low barriers to entry. In today's market, we are the second largest provider with about 3% market share, and the largest provider has about 4% market share based on installed capacity. If you combine that with around 3,000 competitors, it's a very interesting industry to compete in, and for us on a national scale. It's also worth noting that historically, the sale was made by physically visiting a site, reviewing the customer's site, and then going away to consider the right system and form up a quote. We would then wait while the customer considered that quote, and subject to the sale being made, the installation would then be scheduled again on another day. It was often the same person or business doing the sale and then coming back to do the install later. But at Origin, as a national retailer, we do most of our work over the phone, probably around 80%, and because that's historically the nature of our relationship with most of our customers. So we have for many years operated over the phone and used satellite imagery to do our designs and try and avoid a pre-sale and pre-install site assessment. In some cases, we would need to do a pre-install site assessment if there was any uncertainty about the premise and the requirements for a successful install. In providing solar and storage options to consumers, it's always worth considering why a customer chooses to invest in solar and why they would come to origin. You can see in this chart that while there's an environmental benefit of the investment, the main driver is still whether or not the consumer will save money. Due to the nature of the upfront payment and the benefits over time, the decision for consumers is more like a total cost of ownership decision that has payback periods of typically between three to seven years if the system is sized correctly. You'll also see that feed-in tariffs and payment terms are key considerations, but they are just inputs into that total cost of ownership decision. A consumer's decision is based on three key drivers. Firstly, the upfront cost of the system, noting any financial or payment terms. The second is the displacement of grid energy by using the energy from the solar system directly in the home. And the third is the earned revenue from energy exported to the grid by what we call feed-in tariffs. As the example in the attached image shows, a household that consumes say five megawatt hours per year from the grid pre-solar may move to a household that only consumes three and a half megawatt hours directly from the grid and produces two megawatt hours from their solar install and so offsets one and a half megawatt hours of usage in the home and exports the other half a megawatt hour to the grid. This example is oversimplified and can be impacted by a couple of other variables. One variable is grid tariffs. Many consumers pay time of use tariffs, which means that the grid price is normally cheapest during the day when the sun is shining and the load on the network and the generation is at its lowest. The price then becomes higher in the late afternoon to evening when there is more demand on the network from households. Another impact is feed-in tariff rates. In a competitive market, these rates vary from retailer to retailer, depending on how that retailer values the energy that is exported or returned to the grid. Another impact is usage profiles. How much usage is of the time generation is occurring from the solar system during sunshine hours? And then there's the differential in rates. 
depending on the time of use tariffs, grid rates can sometimes be up around 25 to 30 cents during peak times. They can also be down as low as 6 to 10 cents a kilowatt hour in off-peak times. And your feed-in tariffs sit at around 6 to 10 cents. So all of this means there's much more value for the household in the energy that is used directly in the home. So the new system allows users to provide a simple address to look up and see what their solar opportunity is. It has an intuitive interface that allows customers to see in near real time what the solar setup can look like on the property. The inputs utilised include the home, its orientation, the roof size, the roof pitch and roof material. It also matches up the technical options around the panel types, sizes, the inverter capacity and even the battery and storage options if that's a viable investment for the customer. Given our internal information around the customer's usage, we can also orchestrate an outbound campaign that matches the customer's existing tariffs and usage profiles to the insight about the house as described above. This will allow us to show a customer what the best option for them is from a payback perspective. As I mentioned earlier, the old way of selling solar was to invest a lot of time into each system with a large amount of human intervention and gathering of information and data from numerous sources. And sometimes this was onerous on, onerous on the customer too. With the new system that we developed together with Accenture and Google Cloud, we can digitally capture the required information. We then use the artificial intelligence and machine learning to optimize system and options. This then allows us to um, an immediate playback to the customer of a quote. The machine learning and AI models used means the customer has a tailored solution and they can be confident that the system hasn't been oversized or undersized for their usage profile. Historically, assessing the suitability of a roof for solar and determining where to place panels has been performed by knowledge workers who piece together many components to arrive at a recommendation. Whilst this is a proven approach, it does take time and it can't really scale to provide a real-time advice to many customers simultaneously. The innovative origin model uses visual AI and geometry to enable almost unlimited parallel solution assessments within a very easy to understand customer experience. There are five key steps in the new process. The first step looks to understand the type of roof being considered. Is it the right material? or is it more ornate tiles, which could be problematic for the installation. The second and third steps break down the overall roof area into segments, provide insights on the roof slope and orientation to the sun, and provide the gross available area that potentially could be used for solar. The final steps, four and five, place panels on the roof in line with the recommendations for a customer in terms of usage and what is possible from a solution perspective. Collectively, these steps are performed in under 30 seconds. To date, we are seeing customers' journey time shortened while still being able to configure a system and outcome that is personalized for the customer's property and usage profile. The quote is accurate and allows confidence that it is a robust assessment of the data and information to build the recommendation quote. We are getting higher interaction net promoter scores through the new platform than previously and the customers can choose what time of day they choose to per interact with us and consider the purchase options. We're also seeing lower cancellation rates on orders due to the increased confidence in the system design and roof structure information. This lower cancellation rate leads to more efficient operations. The machine learning and the team progressing the platform are constantly working on improving the proposition and building continuous improvement cycles that have us enjoying the opportunity of many ideas and options to keep refining the performance of the platform and the customer experience. I would also note that the platform allows some of our partners to consider white labeling the competency to allow them to introduce their customers to renewable and distributed generation and storage in a way that they can trust the experience, that it's going to be customer experience accretive and that the customer won't be delayed or held up in any transfers or movements between the organizations. An important philosophy that worked well with this was to try and get an MVP to market as quickly as possible so that we could test and refine the customer's experience with real insight and data. Our MVP focused on limited geographies and house types in the first instance and then expanded beyond there. 
We have seen customer preferences change rapidly in this environment, so our ability to adapt the proposition is very important. We knew the outcomes we had in mind, and with that, it was fundamental to bring the partners together and ensure the cross-functional team saw the vision and shared the optimism. This was important because the work crossed many businesses, teams, and skills. After building the MVP, it was just a matter of iterating and iterating through until we had most of the geography and building types covered. And now we're circling back on other ideas and opportunities we saw along the way, as well as thinking about how we continue this experience all the way through the sales cycle and included all the way through the installation cycle. Thank you. That was a great example of how to take advantage of market dynamics to quickly develop a new valuable application to surprise and delight consumers. Last and certainly not least, we wanted to leave you with a special story discussing Web3 and the world of cryptocurrency with Hedera. Joshua Cindy is a staff engineer with Swirls Labs and was previously a principal architect and DevOps manager for Hedera. What excites me about a conference like this is that we get to talk about the future, all the wonderful possibilities in front of us and the opportunity to turn them into reality. It's literally in the title, what's next? But innovation doesn't really happen in a vacuum. So in order to understand what's next, we need to look into the past, what was, to contextualize and understand what can be. And I wanna go back to ancient history. So like 11 years ago in crypto terms, that's the beginning of time, roughly. About 11 years ago, I built my very own Bitcoin exchange. You could buy Bitcoin through it, and I was working with this payment provider. This was so early that there weren't any real regulations around the industry, and that provider ended up suspending me, and that was the end of that service. Why? They saw some risk here. What was the risk exactly? Well, to give you an example, my solution itself bought Bitcoin from Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox, if you didn't know, was a bit infamous eight years ago for losing 850,000 or so Bitcoins. Through some theft, fraud, mismanagement, or a mix of all three, it was never really clear. So the payment provider saw some risk here and deplatformed me, and rightfully so. That payment provider was, well, Google Checkout. So I may be the only customer success segment here where I've actually been deplatformed by Google at one point but that's water under the bridge. So why am I here? Well, fast forward to present day, we have built something amazing at Hedera that I would like to share with you. How Google Cloud helped us build it and why I'm excited to share about what's next. Again, in the interest of looking to the past to understand what's next, 12 years ago, Dr. Lehman Baird invented the Hashgraph algorithm. This algorithm underpins the Hedera network. Lehman set out to solve a decades old math problem, not just build a better blockchain. The concept of blockchain has been around for over 20 years. There are 2000 plus projects which all depend on blockchain, but if blockchain didn't exist, Hedera would still exist. Hashgraph solves a network of computers coming to consensus on an event where no individual is necessarily trusted, but does so with extreme speed, high throughput, and at the highest security possible. It also has low costs, which are predictable and which an enterprise can plan around. I got into Google Cloud in 2016 for their Kubernetes service. This solved 90% of the problems I didn't want to focus on. Interestingly enough, Kubernetes is antithetical to decentralization. It is a centralized control plane for managing resources on large compute clusters. We were in a position where we needed each node in the Hedera network to be completely independent of each other and maintained by a separate organization. These organizations could be adversaries or competitors. Kubernetes, the tool of choice, wasn't going to cut it. We continue to use containers, but we developed our own node management tool. This tool uses threshold signatures from our council to orchestrate updates in a decentralized way. While this is itself its own interesting problem. It's a pretty straightforward engineering problem. And what it unlocks for us is to focus on our business case. How do you establish a network governed by large corporate and non-corporate entities across industry, across business segment, and across continents, and have them govern our network? 
What do these enterprises, banks, and universities all have in common? Well, try to get them to decide on something about their own business. How to make an investment, how to structure themselves or plan for their future. Imagine now how the largest aerospace manufacturer makes a decision or the largest bank in Africa. How about the largest search engine? Now, what about all of them trying to make a decision together? When we talk about what's next, we talk about Hedera. That aerospace company is Boeing, the bank is Standard Bank, and the search engine is Google. Google joined the governing council in December 2019, accepting council member responsibilities such as Google runs a single consensus node in the Hedera mainnet. Google is the equal part owner of, the, of Hedera. Google also sits on the technical and regulatory committees that govern the network. They are bought into the idea of Web3 and what the Hashgraph algorithm can do and what the Hedera public network built on top of it offers. For Google Cloud, this led to them understanding and investing not just in Hedera, but in the broader Web3 ecosystem in general. Google Cloud has formed a team dedicated to Web3 called Digital Assets Web3, and has approximately 50 people on that core team, with an additional 150 individuals working across Google in YouTube, search, engineering, ventures, and payments. And that describes Google, and Google is one of the 26 members. Hedera intends to grow that to 39 governing council members across different geographies and industries. So what can I share? When I think about taking your idea and making a business about it, I think about those poor baby turtles. If you've watched Planet Earth, you know what I'm talking about. Most of them fail to make it, getting eaten by birds, crabs, various sea life, whatever. So do a vast majority of ideas fail. Maybe the idea was bad or worse, the idea was good, but it simply wasn't its time. For me, my timing just wasn't right. But for you, that baby turtle, that fragile, unproven idea could make it. And maybe that time is exactly right and it starts something amazing. So what do these Web3 turtles have in front of them? What makes the time right for them? Well, a lot of things I didn't have. You have partners like Google who are eager to have you, who will grant you credits even, to use their platform like we do. You have demand, and I'm not just talking about the demand of something like pictures of rocks or monkeys or coins with dogs on them, but demand from established companies. Look no further than our governing council. They are bought in on this idea. You have proof of economic value of the technology underlying your idea, whether it be large banks establishing remittance POCs using digital tokens, industry-managed nonprofits building a platform for redeeming coupons, law firms tokenizing real-world assets, the largest packaging and distribution company in the world proving the carbon footprint of your product as a service. These are the Hedera use cases. And as a Web3 entrepreneur, what you have in front of you is a network like Hedera. We offer a number of things. Fast finality, meaning your transaction is final in seconds, Fairness that keeps the leaders from adjusting the transaction order. Energy efficiency. Per the University of London economic study, we are the greenest solution on the planet. We're even carbon negative. Fixed transaction fees, meaning your costs of your solution isn't wildly unpredictable. Decentralized governance by the big names we mentioned before. And so what does it mean? What's next? Well, with the Hashgraph algorithm, and platforms such as Google Cloud, maybe that idea you had might not fade into obscurity because of the ecosystem, the demand, and the underlying technology is here. Maybe it has the potential now to grow up to be a massive sea turtle. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to these valuable stories of innovation and transformation. If you are interested in sharing any one of these stories, you can find these sessions in the featured section of the Next catalog. Thank you and enjoy the rest of Next.